the next presentation will be delivered by Vanya Ivansavich, a professor at Zagreb University in the Faculty of Law. His talk will be dedicated accordingly to the Croatian legal solutions. Despite, despite his young age, the teaching, research, as well as professional experiences of Professor Savic are very rich and include scholarships, fellowships, lectures, and workshops in many important scientific institutions of the world, including University of Edinburgh, Brigham Young University, University of Adelaide, University of Vienna, and even Vietnam National University in Hanoi. He was also one of the original signatories to Punta del Este Declaration on Human Dignity for Everyone, Everywhere. His scientific interests specifically include law, religion, and state, together with religious legal systems, as well as human rights in the European context. Vanya, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. This is really a surprise, Piotr, that you are here as a moderator. Piotr is an old friend. It's so good to see you. And it's good to see Balash and all other names which are here on the, on the <clears throat> screen. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be at this uh, conference as a part of our project. You know, at the beginning, just want to say a few words. There was a great Croatian theologian, uh, Shagi Bunic, who said, you know, if I need to speak for two hours about the topic, I can do it tomorrow morning. But if you want me to speak 15 minutes about the topic, then give me two months. So, you know, I think all of us know what this means to talk about a huge topic like this in just 15 minutes. But uh, that, for that reason, I will not have PowerPoint presentation. I'll try to express my thoughts about what I, what I have written about this and what is really important as, as a, I would say, metaphysical fiber of what we are doing here. I think the, the major, major thing is to ask ourselves, what is the legal culture of the Central and Eastern Europe we all belong to? Why I'm saying all this? Uh, I, 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 I'll try to put a little bit a different uh, perspective uh, on, on the material, on, on the topics we are dealing here with. Uh, it will be more maybe historical, metaphysical, theo maybe it will have parts of theological thought, but I was thinking this year, we have 10 years since Lao Tzu case, Lao Tzu versus Italy. And I was expecting when I was uh, uh, preparing for this conference to hear from each colleagues from Central and Eastern Europe, from each one of those countries, that we will all have the same problem. First, we have, I called it damaged tradition caused by communist and socialist rule until 1990, 1991, from the end of the uh, Second World War until uh, uh, fall up of the Berlin Wall. And at the same time, we will all have a lack of uh, documents, lack of legislation regarding religious symbol in public sphere. So, and for now, I see all colleagues are on the same grounds of following the same pattern. And what I wanna say, I wanna say that it's very important to think what would happen if case from each of our countries would come in front of the European Court of Human Rights. What if, so the, the, the title of my talk will be, what if, what if case from Poland, from Czech Republic, from Serbia, from Slovenia, from Hungary or from Croatia comes with the similar elements in front of the European Court of Human Rights. And we know that in the in, in Laozi case, that all instances in Italy were saying basically one thing, that crucifix and the cross on the wall is part of Italian identity, but not just as a flag, as an emblem, 
but also as a part, as administrative court in, in the case said in Italy, as a part of, uh, it, it was interesting, interestingly said that Christianity is river which goes below the ground in the karst, which maybe we don't see, but it's there. So freedom, tolerance, democracy, actually, all are coming from that ground, which is based on Judeo-Christian tradition. And the thing uh, which we all face with aggressive secularization, just recently I published an article uh, about aggressive secularization. It's a paradox that the sec secularity was, was Catholic invention. Pope Gregory VII actually was thinking about secularity as a form to prevent feudal landlords to interfere in church and sacral issues. What is what came from that uh, today? And we have development of secularity, which transformed itself in secularism, which became also a world war you. Professor Nemetz, he was talking about, interestingly, uh, about neutrality. What neutrality means? What neutrality of state means, actually? It's not very clear. It's also kind of legal standard we are using. So what happened that today, presence of religious symbols is, is becoming much more problematic than it was before, which is a paradox in the world of religious freedoms and freedom of thought, which is in its essence, a product of Christian legal thought and legal thinking. And we have to be aware of this. this, this these are foundations. And I'm sure all of our countries are facing the same problem. So I want to talk a little bit about Croatia and what, what does it mean to, to uh, fight for religious freedoms in this context? It's a paradox that we have two, two Europes now. One Europe, which was free, democratic, full of prosperity until 1990, I would say 1990, 1991. And we have our Europe, which was suppressed, which was where religious freedoms were prevented, where church was prosecuted, and where religious life really was underground. We lived in a way, it depends, of course, in which country you lived, but we lived in the catacombs. And it was shown once again that living in the catacombs, living underground, make religion flourish, make religion flourish, not just because of it, of course, because of spiritual strength, but religion was a, a, in a way a sign of freedom, of belonging to the free thought, free world. And we have situation that Western Europe, when, where re religious could flourish, it didn't happen. We have empty churches, churches which become bars, hotels, and where, where church attendance is low and we have Eastern Europe, Central Europe, our part of Europe, where people still feel that religion is another name, I would say for their freedom. And the problem is, the problem is that the Western colleagues from the Western part of Europe many times, many times are forgetting foundations and the importance of religious freedom for for freedom in general. When I talk about Croatia, I was looking back to 18th century where Croatia uh, Catholicism was proclaimed as a state religion. Then first concordat during the Austro-Hungarian Empire in, 19, in 1855, where Catholic, Catholic Church was proclaimed as official, was that, uh, and of course, Protestant four years later, Protestants were put on the same level. And after Croatia joined, uh, Croatia and Slavonia were part of, of uh, Hungarian, part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, that Croatian parliament has 
uh, ability, freedom, or, or capacity, it's better to say capacity, to govern religious issues. And I would say after Austria, which, uh, uh, which uh, was the first country to recognize Islam in, in Europe, Croatia was the second one because of obvious proximity with Bosnia and Herzegovina and many members of, of um, Islamic community live uh, in, in Croatian lands. So I would say religious freedoms, the level of religious freedom in Croatia is really top class, I would say even for European uh, perspective. The thing is that uh, basically all major religions were recognized, but with strong influence and presence of the Catholic Church. During the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, and Kingdom of Yugoslavia before the World War II, religious symbols were present everywhere, although, although in Croatia, Concordat was, was not signed with, with, uh, uh, between the uh, uh, king and, and the Holy See. It was really an unlogical situation. Even Serbian authors are, are saying that it was unfair and really unlogical. The country where 40% of population were Catholic, Roman Catholic or Greek Catholic, they didn't have agreement uh, which would govern relationship between uh, their religion and the state. All other, even small, even Jews, or Muslims, they have agreement with the state before the World War II, but Catholic Church didn't have because Serbian Orthodox Church strongly opposed uh, because they were feared that Vatican Western influence will then influence uh, 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 House of, of Karadžojevic. It's, it's pretty clear Serbian authors are also writing about that. But on in the ground, religious symbols were present everywhere. There were military chaplains, there were support, religious support in hospitals, although not regulated as Catholics would like to, to have. And then during the Second World War, also Christian symbols were present. And when this all ended, in 1995, in 1945, excuse me, 1946. It's very hard to get the data about how this happened. But I was exploring documents from Croatian Historical Museum and Croatian School of Museum and found photographs of old classrooms. And I found that crucifix was on all classrooms everywhere, all in Croatia, which actually was crucifix was expelled somewhere in between 1945, 1946. So what happened? Communists came and it happened all over the Europe and religion was proclaimed as opium for the masses and thrown away from public sphere. You know, education, we can talk about religious symbols in hospitals, in military institutions, on the crossroads everywhere, but the major, the most important place where religion is to be debated is education, where young people are. We all know that. Schools, primary schools, secondary schools, and of course, universities. That's where the, where the battle will happen. And all over and over we'll talk about the same things and every fall we will talk about religious education in public schools, in public sphere, but basically it's about education. And then we have decades of religion in the private sphere, not in public anymore. It was present in public sphere through life of the people. But the thing, the, the, the issue here is that uh, only after 1990, religious symbols came back to public sphere again. And then the cities which called, we have a small village here in Croatia, Sveti Ivan Zelina, which is Saint John of Zelina, 
was renamed again and gets Saint in front of the name of the village, Sveti Philip, Jakob, Saint Philip and Jacob. And then saints came back on the, in the streets, on the name of the streets, on the name of the cities, villages, and so on. Why I'm saying all this from historical perspective? What if someone said, crucifix shouldn't be on the wall in school, or crucifix shouldn't be anywhere, as a matter of fact. And, and, and this person appears in front of the European Court of Human Rights and said, whoa, you know, no tradition. We are Croatia or Czech Republic or Poland. It's not as Italy. And the judges, judges are asking, why explain this? Well, it's obvious. It's obvious. It's not part of tradition. Look, for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, religion is out. So tradition is gone. But as the lawyers, we always have to be aware what is what actually means to break tradition. What makes things operate in bona fide? What makes things uh, with continuity? There is no continuity. And my, my idea is that all countries from Central and Eastern Europe, from Croatia to Slovakia and Poland, all over, could say that tradition was eliminated forcibly and then tradition existed, but existed in exile. Although we don't have regulation, and that's something we have to talk as lawyers, as professors of law, what we should do to put things in order, of course, in a way that everyone, you know, being a Christian means being open to everyone. Being a Christian means not throwing a stone on everyone. Being a Christian means talking to everyone. And in the essence of Christianity, as, as uh, courts in Italy would say, is tolerance and freedom and choice, it all comes from Christianity. So I'm not talking about making another antagonization, but about respecting predominant legal culture of Europe, which actually then allows Muslims, Jews, everyone to live in harmony with people who are there as a majority and majority of this part of Europe is Christian. Throwing away values which are Christian means throwing away values of freedom, tolerance, dignity, and that's grounds on we have to fight to explain. But if you throw my worldview, the value of Christianity, you will throw everything else which is coming with this. And this is harmony of living of every people next to each other. And what if case comes from Poland to the European Court of uh, Human Rights? What would you say to judges? Is there tradition of having crucifix equally as it was in Italy? And would the, the decision be the same as in Laozi versus Italy case? Of course, Cro Catholic Church in Croatia was a forerunner for all other religious communities. Treaties which were signed with the Holy See, four treaties, actually allowed to all others and speed, speeded up agreements with Orthodox community, with Protestant community, with Muslims, with Jews. And when I speak with the religious leaders of those groups, all are saying we are cheering for Catholic church here because Catholic church is protecting our rights because of the treaties with Catholic church, all other groups have rights. So 
at the end, I don't know, I didn't look at the, the, uh, the watch, but uh, I'll just try to, to be brief on, on conclusion. I'm just arguing that tradition was, was forcibly, abruptly broken, but tradition existed. And the second, it, I will just read a few words from my paper. In practice, it means, just, just a small digression, because of political correctness, what's happening today in schools, in public sphere, in TV, that people are not saying Merry Christmas anymore. People are saying happy holidays. What happy holidays means? If Christmas is or Easter is official holiday and everyone is going home, enjoying life with their families, free day, then it's completely normal to say Merry Christmas, Happy Easter. Of course, you can say, you're not believer, you're Muslim, you're Jew. I want you to be happy. I want that your day is perfect for you. But we shouldn't first, on the first, uh, uh, on the, in the first place, academics, intellectuals, if we are not clear about this, how we can expect that other follow, what they should follow. So saying Merry Christmas, Happy Easter, from us to our students is the important. We work in public institutions and it's not offending anyone. In practice, in practice, it means that many people who celebrate, for instance, Easter are not believers, but are enjoying to be the part of the tradition which they also belong to. In this case, the culture of Christianity. European landscapes are filled with churches and chapels and those towers with crosses mean something at least in historical and identity sense. Flags of Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden and Norway and United Kingdom and Greece bear crosses and no one should have doubts that many of its citizens are not even believers or agnostics. It certainly does not mean that those flags have to be changed because of many people of those Scandinavian countries and Britain or Greece do not believe. Who can imagine Saint Paul de Vence in France or Sveti Filip in Jako in Croatia without prefixes of the sainthood? No reasonable, reasonable human should ever think about erasing words which are not just etymological, they are symbols of tradition, peace, tolerance, and dignity. And this is my uh, conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanya, for your paper and the inspiring insights into the consequences of religious freedom in its original meaning in the context, cultural, uh, historical context of our countries. Thank you.